So I did my residency in general surgery, and that means that I spent five years sleeping an average of four hours a night. And I could tell you the funniest, goofiest stories of what I did in my sleep-deprived states. And up until recently, maybe three years ago, the only thing I appreciated from that chapter of my life was that I had a difficult time consolidating new memories. So in other words, I was willing to grant you that sleep deprivation resulted in uh, you know, hippocampal misfunction. I mean, the hippocampus, which is partly responsible for consolidating new memories, wasn't working. So yeah, I, there's a bunch of stuff I forget. Like, I don't, I don't remember much of anything about meeting my wife. We met in residency. <laughs> and like, she always asks me about, like, do you remember that place we went to and how special that was? And no. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's bad enough, right? But I think what's worse is I remember at the, end of that peri- at the end of that five years, looking at all my hormones and seeing how absolutely destroyed they were. You know, my testosterone was a little higher than a 13-year-old girl, but not much. <laughs> and, you know, cortisol was through the roof. And so, so why is that the case? Well, I now understand that, courtesy of a really good friend of mine named Kirk Parsley, who's a former Navy SEAL, but now a physician, works with SEALs and specializes in sleep, I just have a completely new appreciation for why sleep is so important, and that's why it's third on my list. Um, I'll tell you one funny story that Kirk told me three years ago when I was sort of pushing back on the idea that I needed more than six hours of sleep. Because my view was life is short, and I want to live all of it, and I sure as hell don't want to be sleeping through any of it. I'm kind of pissed that I have to sleep at all. (laughs) And he said... Do you think that sleep was a relatively safe or dangerous activity for our ancestors? I love evolutionary biology. And I was like, yeah, probably pretty dangerous. I mean, to be unconscious in the presence of prey, probably not a good thing. He goes, right, so we know that our ancestors slept between seven and nine hours a day. Not all in one shot, by the way. It was two blocks, we believe. Um, Do you think that if one of them had acquired a mutation to outplay sleep, to basically you know, go around that, would that gene have proliferated like crazy? And the answer is, yeah, it probably would have. Think about what a survival advantage would have been if there had been mutations that have allowed people to have not slept or to have slept four hours. And I saw his point, right? Which is that that gene never came along. Here we are, still sleeping. So so sleep is super important. And, um, you know, during the, the breakout, I'll go into a handful of things that everybody can do that I call just sort of really basic sleep hygiene that can enhance your sleep. But if you're in the camp that I was in, which says sleep is for the weak, I would would offer that one, you can be much more productive in your time if you sleep more, but more importantly, I think the benefits in terms of longevity are significant. Okay, the fourth is management of chronic stress. This again gets a little bit back to sort of evolutionary biology. So we evolved in an environment that taught us a lot about acute stress. Obviously, there was always sort of a battle going on. There was predator-prey interaction. Um, And the system, the adrenal gland, which is responsible for secreting the hormones that respond to that, the epinephrine, norepinephrine pathway, we have a pretty good handle on, you know, how those things work. And our body responds pretty well to those in short order. You know, when you need your heart rate to go up, when you need to be perspiring, when you need to be shutting off your GI system, fighting, flighting, all these things, That's all great. The problem is we live in a world now that looks a lot different from the one in which we evolved, and it now seems that chronic stress is the bigger problem. And so there's this family of hormones called glucocorticoids, of course, cortisol being the poster child for them, which I'm sure you all heard of, that that actually wreak havoc in a way that I don't think I even to this day fully appreciate, though with each passing day um, and with each new interaction I have with a patient, uh, I'm, I'm becoming to appreciate, I'm becoming to appreciate uh, just how significant this is. So um, remember how I talked about how insulin is a very anabolic hormone, meaning it wants to build up fat and build up muscle. Uh, testosterone is an anabolic hormone to muscle, but it's a catabolic hormone. It breaks down fat. And cortisol is the exact reverse. So cortisol is actually anabolic to fat, wants to make you fatter, but it's catabolic to muscle, wants to break down muscle. So you really don't want elevated levels of cortisol. Now, of course, you need some cortisol, so no cortisol is adrenal crisis. That's problematic. But I'll tell you, um, long before somebody gets to too little cortisol, which is typically the ultimate state of fatigue, they're often in the state of too much cortisol. 
And again, this is one of those things that we can test for this and we can um, invoke lots of changes in a person's life to fix that. And I'll share with you just one, uh, one non-pharmacologic one, which is transcendental meditation. So about three years ago, two years ago, I became, I finally had had enough of hearing about meditation and I kind of wanted to understand it a little bit better. So I began reading incessantly about it. Um, you know, basically there are three overarching schools of meditation and I sort of explored each one. Um, in the end, I decided that for me, Transcendental was the best one by far, only because the literature was by far the most robust in TM versus the others. Um, and secondly, I just found it to be the easiest for me to do. And so part of the game is find something that you can do. You know, effectiveness matters if you want efficacy. Okay, fifth is hormonal optimization. So as we age, a bunch of things happen, right? We tend to get slower, we tend to get fatter, colder, less energetic. All of those things are controlled by the endocrine system. And there are four, broadly speaking, four endocrine systems. One that controls fuel partitioning, which means how does what you eat know where to go and how do you access it again? You have the thyroid system, you have the adrenal system, which we just spoke about, and you have the androgen system, the sex hormones. And uh, obviously we could spend an hour just talking about this. It's a very hot button issue, both with men and women, um, given that we have a couple of hours later this afternoon be happy to get into a sort of a, 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 an overview of both HRT, hormone replacement therapy, in men and women. Uh, for, for now, I'll just say the following. Um, the mainstream view of this is shockingly outdated um, and seems almost more dogmatic than interested in the truth or the, the science behind it. Um, I suspect that this is hurt by the fact that there are lots of charlatans out there that sort of have you know, a product or a, or a, or a thing to sell uh, that, that may well be harmful. Um, but, but the reality of it is the, um, the current mainstream view, for example, that women should not receive hormone replacement therapy post, post menopause is, um, is simply not grounded in science. Um, which is not to say every woman should be on hormone replacement therapy, but certainly that we would let symptomatic women go through menopause without hormone replacement therapy is uh, about the cruelest thing I think we've ever done. Uh, not to mention what it's doing to their risk of uh, heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, diabetes. The sixth one is pharmacology. So I get asked all the time, hey doc, is fill in the blank good? You know, is statins good? And I'm like, oh, I guess, how do you even answer that question? It's like, would you go up to a carpenter and say, hey carpenter, are hammers good? <laughs> it's like, no, I mean, like, be more specific in your question, right? Hammers are very good if you have to put nails into pieces of wood. They are really bad if you have to put Phillips screws into drywall. Similarly, every drug needs to be viewed that way. So in the right patient, someone with an elevated LDL particle number who's already gone through X, Y, and Z therapy, or an elevated you know, LP little a particle number, yes, a statin can be a very valuable tool provided their desmosterol level is high enough to justify the inhibition of cholesterol synthesis. I, don't, I realize that sounds more tech. Point is, it's a really nuanced answer, but there are about 20 drugs out there that are, com that are highly used and unfortunately generally not used correctly. You know, there's sort of, tr everything's treated like a hammer when in reality, think about the system we're tinkering with. We want fine surgical tools, just like the ones that were outside of this room that I got to play with a little bit before this talk. Um, the seventh one was sense of purpose and social support. It's really interesting to me, and this one's a hard one to test uh, sort, of, sort of rigorously in clinical trials, but the ecology or the epidemiology of this is, is at least suggestive, and I, I don't quite see the downside, so I think it's worth suggesting, right? Which is people who retire early and kind of give up or, not give up, maybe give up their sense of purpose, whatever it is that they were working on, whether it be their company or their mission or whatever, um, they tend to have poorer long-term outcomes than people who continue to work. And Again, without randomization, we have no idea of knowing cause there, but there's certainly a plausible mechanism. And we see this when we see, um, you know, some of you may have seen recently Doug Flutie's parents passed away, but within amazing succession of each other. We see that all the time, this broken heart syndrome, right? Like, you know, a, a couple that, that has lived together for 60 years and one dies, and then within days or weeks, the other one dies. So there, there really is something to this sense of wanting to live and having something to live for. And I have a, 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 a good friend who's a psychiatrist, and um, we were talking about this one day, and she said, yes, Peter, you know, I completely agree. In fact, it's part of my practice. I prescribe purpose. 
So again, not going to get into it for, because I don't have much time, but um, I'll share with you one anecdote. Uh, great advice that I was given during medical school, which was anytime you find yourself in a situation where you're sort of not happy with whatever's going on, you're sort of stressed about your own little world, find somebody who would give anything to be in your shoes and, and go and help them do that. Right? So, that's, so, so at the time, I remember going to help some undergrads, because I was in med school, and of course, the undergrads are dying to get into med school, and I'm just sitting here stressing some exam or something. And you, you realize when you can step out of yourself and make it about somebody else, um, life becomes a lot better. And remember, we're not just optimizing on lifespan, which is the length of life, it's also health span. The final thing is avoiding these harmful behaviors. So I'll just give you one example, because we're, we're almost out of time, and I want to have a couple questions. Um, we talked about accidents. Right? Still the fifth leading cause of death in aggregate, and of them, the largest by far is accidents. About 55% of accidents take place on freeways, the, re the rest on surface streets, and most of those surface streets take place in intersections. So if you want to not die in a car accident, you've got to not die on the freeway, and you've got to avoid the intersections. Not, not avoid the intersections, but avoid dying in the intersections. So what are two things that we can talk about? Well, on the freeway, it really comes down to distracted driving, doesn't it? And we live in an age, and it depends on where you live, and you know, I split my time between New York and San Diego, so I see two very different sets of behaviors. But in California, man, I think 80% of drivers, according to one survey I saw, are texting while driving. So it's not enough to not text while you're driving, which I'm assuming if you've got this far in the talk, you figured that one out. It's, you've got to assume every other idiot on the road is texting while they're driving. So this is really called attentive driving. And frankly, um, you know, one of my obsessions is driving race cars. Um, because in part, you're really learning how to handle a car at its limit. And so it might be about taking defensive driving courses or taking car control courses and just frankly being aware at all times of what's going on and just assuming everybody in the road is trying to kill you. They woke up today with one goal in mind, which is how can I kill you? How can I ruin your life and the life of your family? And if you take that approach, you're going to drive a lot smarter. On the intersections, um, one of my best friends from high school is a truck driver, and he actually taught me this lesson many years ago which is the fatal accident in the intersection is almost always the left side hit to the driver. So you have the right of way, you're going through the intersection, and the, the, the guy running the red hits you on your side. So what he said is a truck driver, he never goes through an intersection without looking left, even when he has the right of way. And so I would just encourage you to make that motor memory switch, and anytime you're driving, you're looking through. It doesn't mean you're going to avoid the accident, but it sure gives you a shot at avoiding what can be the fatal accident.